So I'll just say welcome everybody again to the solidarity sessions. Tonight we have Tala Alai, Al, Ali, sorry, uh, a Palestinian psychotherapist, um, and he's going to give us his perspective uh, on life under apartheid. Um, the webinar is being recorded, but attendees' details are not shown except for, sp for speakers. Uh, we'll have live questions. Uh, oh, sorry, live questions uh, can only be submitted using the Zoom Q and A button, which you will see on the bottom of your screen. So it's the one there on the right hand side. Uh, we've turned off the chat because we just couldn't handle uh, that meant that much communications. Uh, we've got well over a hundred people on the call now, so we just couldn't handle all the chat. So we'll we'll focus on the Q and A, and we will answer those questions either verbally or uh, by text. Uh, if you've got other questions, you can also email them to education at IPC, ipsc.ie. And we have a short poll, which if we have time for, we'll we'll carry out uh, later on in the in the session. So, Tala, I'm going to hand over to you. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. And looking forward to hearing your presentation. You're still on mute there, Tala. No, yeah, thank you. Fine. Thanks Great. so much, Tom, for the introduction. And thanks for uh, IPSC for organizing this and for inviting me. It's always great to have the chance to, to speak about uh, Palestine and to speak about our experience there because it's hardly a, a heard in the media. I will uh, try to take my time speaking about my personal experience because nothing will be uh, easier than speaking about the life I've lived and describing how apartheid affected that. And then speak about other examples of other people's lives and about the, the, the uh, life under apartheid in general, uh, according to Israeli laws and, and a, a constitution. So I will aim to speak about examples until I reach to 40 minutes, and then I will stop because I believe we can spend 40 hours speaking about particular examples of, of life under our side. However, a, a, before I start, I just would like to have a small exercise with everyone uh, this exercise is just to to kind of get us in, in the mood, energize our brains. And also afterwards, there might be a little bit of, of, of uh, disturbance to it and the second part of it, but to have an idea as well how life is in Palestine. So I'd like you to imagine that it's 2 p.m. and in the afternoon in a nice sunny Sunday. You live in an apartment on the third floor. You just put your six month old to bed and your three year old is busy with the her coloring book while also you're having a cup of tea with your mother in law. Your partner is out for grocery and uh, everything is fine. Beautiful day, as we said. However, your friends came to the house, told you everything is organized. Your partner is happy with this as well. And they booked you holidays for four days in Spain. And you only have one minute to gather whatever you want to gather, to do whatever you want and leave the house. I would like you to think in this one minute, now it's started. What will you do? What will you take? How you'll manage? So you're going on holidays with your friends. Forty seconds left. Thirty seconds. Of course, don't forget your passport. I assume or your passport card. Twenty seconds. Think of anything you need to do, need to take. Ten seconds. Two, one. I'd like you to keep some notes. Uh, either you write them down or you try to remember 
what did you take? What did you do in these uh, uh, 60 seconds? And now I'll take you with me to Palestine. Let's say to Gaza now, because Gaza is, is, is what's suffering the most. And, and uh, when the Israeli army sometimes uh, uh, do airstrikes, they used to do this a lot in the West Bank, but now luckily it's less, but sadly it's more in Gaza. They would send something Israel calls a, a warning missile, but its its actual name is a leading missile. It's a small missile that would hit the building and would guide the bigger missile that the one uh, that the hundred uh, thousand or two thousand tons missile were to hit so they can be very precise so uh, once the leading missile hits your building you have 60 seconds to leave because within 60 seconds the bigger missile will come and destroy the building it's the very same scenario and you have a 60 seconds what will you do if you get the leading missiles hit your building. If it's very disturbing for some of you, you don't have to think of it. Now 50 seconds left. You can hear your neighbors screaming, running around. You're on the third floor. Now you have 40 seconds. You have one child asleep. The other child is doing the coloring books. Your mother-in-law is a little bit old, hard to walk. 30 seconds. There is screaming in the street. You feel sense of chaos in the whole building and even in, that, in the neighboring buildings. You have 15 seconds. You can hear the airplane. The jet fighters are nearby. Six seconds, five, four, Three, two. Now that's a, this thing happens many times now in Gaza during one day. And it used to happen in the past. I luckily, and the West Bank during the second and father survived this three times. One of these times it was a building next to ours, it wasn't the building where I stayed. But it's one of the things that are really so hard for the Palestinians to, to decide what they can do. So with the notes you wrote, or whatever things you thought of, what did you take, what did you do, did you leave the house at all? A lot of Palestinian families, when they feel like they live high up in the building, all of them, they gather in one room. So they decide either we all survive or we all die together. It's very hard, but that's the reality of many people. And usually Israel, when they, when they bomb buildings, they bomb dense areas. That's why uh, you, you would hear a very high death toll when, when, they, when they use airstrikes, because they only give 60 seconds to be able, if they would send these leading missiles, and sometimes they'll just strike first. So yeah, that's one of the examples on life under apartheid, life under, under the Israeli occupation. Another thing that's really very, very a, 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 like screaming in our face is that Israel is, 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 is uh, implementing an apartheid system against the Palestinians. It's a statement by Benjamin Netanyahu on his official Instagram was posted on March 2019, ages before the 7th of October. He said, Israel is not a state of all its citizens, but rather the nation state of the Jewish people and only them. So he, he clearly says that Israel is only for Jewish people. No one else, Muslims, Christians, Arabs, can be a, entitled to the same a citizenship or same status or same rights as the Jewish people. Now, the United Nations General Assembly is just a brief a theoretical background, it identified the uh, crime of apartheid as inhumane acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. And this definition is from 1973 or 1976, I'm not sure, I think 73. And this is how the world 
and general identify apartheid. And that's what's going on in Palestine. And Israel is not hiding it, but they don't like the name apartheid because they think that's their right to exercise this racial discrimination. Now we'll start with, with personal uh, uh, examples of, of life under apartheid. Now over 90% of my fa father's family, they cannot live in Palestine nor visit it. So it's for them, they were outside Palestine a, a before 1967 war. They're not refugees, so it's even worse for them because they were outside Palestine in 1967. Some of them left Palestine with a military permission to leave. And then when they came back, Israel didn't allow them in. So 90%, again, of them who were born even in Palestine, a, their parents, they can't go back to Palestine to where they are born. But if any of the listeners here a, is a Jewish and can prove that they're Jewish, they have a Jewish mother, you can claim Israeli citizenship today, tomorrow, and you go live in Palestine. So this is another way of, of understanding the discrimination. Uh, the second uh, uh, example of, of uh, things that affected me personally or affected us and our family under apartheid is the story of my brother who died because uh, the Israeli army blocked the ambulance from gaining access to the hospital. In 2003, I had a brother who was 19 at the time. He needed to... to uh, do a regular kidney dialysis but our village was under a curfew military curfew so my parents called the ambulance and the hospital is only 12 kilometers away from our house so if you would run to the hospital you would arrive within an hour or one and a half hour if you're fit you'll get it in, in, in 50 minutes however they called in the morning and the ambulance arrived to the house at around one in the afternoon and my father took my brother in the ambulance and went, and they had to go through five checkpoints. But some of these checkpoints, Israel would close the roads with either block, cement blocks, or, or they would close it with, the, with diggers. They would destroy the street. So my father would have to carry my brother from the ambulance and move to another ambulance on the other side of the checkpoint that would be waiting for them. And it was December, so it was very rainy, very the worst weather in Palestine you could imagine. It, it's like Ireland in terms of rain and wind and, and a harsh weather. So the ambulance arrived to the house at 1 a p.m. and arrived to the hospital the next day at around half 2 in the morning, half 2 a.m. And my father says every checkpoint where he would be stopped, the soldiers would be laughing at him and they would be telling him, your son is just an animal. Why are you caring? And they would be just insulting my father and my brother with, with their language. And they would search my father. They would search the ambulance. And they wouldn't allow him to just pass easily, even though it, you can clearly see this person is, is, is unwell. So that's the first example, of, or, or the second example, but the very first example inside our house. How apartheid can really be very, very... A, a, cruel and, and uh, uh, inhumane because we believe if my brother was Jewish he would be airlifted to the hospital without a curfew with no reason it would be a completely different treatment so uh, that's a little bit of a tense emotional uh, uh, experience for everyone even in, in, in our neighborhood because everybody liked my brother he was kind of quiet person and he was known at, to be good in school and good in college. He was just in, going towards his second year in college. The second a, example from our house is myself, my story of being hit by an Israeli car in the same year, in 23, in 2003, in my town. And a, a, I was denied the right to sue the driver. So in 2003, it was a few months before the death of my brother. An Israeli car was speeding in our village and they hit me while I was on the bike. And luckily, uh, people in the village could catch the driver 
and take all of the driver's information and the police Palestinian police could take the a, a copy of the of the driver a driving license and ID and then the driver was left to go home a, and I was in the hospital I woke up three or four days later after after the accident because it was the, the injury was in my head I I cracked my skull and and, and they had concussion and I spent two years after on treatment from this accident, uh, we tried to sue the driver in a, in a Palestinian uh, court. What the Palestinian court, they said uh, they don't have a juridistic uh, a power over Israelis, even if the Israelis would be living in settlements in the West Bank. We don't have any power over them with our Palestinian courts. So some people suggested to my parents to find an Israeli solicitor who would be happy to take the case. And we did. We found someone from the Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. And he said he will take it on. And when he went to the court with all paper, tried to, to, sue the, to sue the driver, the Israeli court, they said oh, he wasn't. They saw, uh, that's how the solicitor explained it. He said, I wasn't human enough for an Israeli court to be held for me. So we couldn't sue the driver, and the driver just went away with it. So uh, examples like this would just tell us, I mean, it, it would just tell us how inhuman we, we, we are in the eyes of, of, of Israelis. And we all heard that the statements from, from the Israelis that they are fighting human animals, that we are monsters, that we are, they will, they will repeat the Amalek and all these their biblical uh, narrative. But I believe something like this, even if it was illegal in Ireland and I was hit by someone speeding, this person who'd been speeding, he will be taken to court. They wouldn't tell him, yeah, you hit an illegal migrant, even though I'm not illegal here. Well, I've just given an example. They would say, even if you hit an illegal migrant, still you've done something wrong and this person will be taken to court. But yeah, in, in, in uh, the Israeli system, justice is not really uh, the same as elsewhere. Now, a third uh, uh, or fourth example, uh, also my story of being used as a human shield by the Israeli army. The first time when I was 15, that's the year I was hit by the car. When I was 17, when I was 18 as well, doing my leaving cert. And the last time I could remember it, was when I was 19 in my first year of college. The first time when I was 15, it was after leaving school, we finished, we will go home. And the Israeli army caught me. I wasn't running. I wasn't going anywhere. I wouldn't bother running. I was so like tired just getting back to school after being hit by a car, after spending like four days in a coma and, and two weeks in a hospital. I wouldn't have any energy to to run. So yeah, they caught me and on that time they forced me on a gunpoint to walk in front of their jeeps so uh, no one can throw stones at them. And they were shooting at the students who were running away. They, they were shooting rubber bullets from behind my back. I can't remember they held anyone else uh, as a human shield. It was maybe only me because I was the only person who couldn't run then. Yeah, when I was 17, it was the same. When I was leaving school. And uh, this time, also, there, there wasn't any throwing stones or anything. They were just uh, randomly catching students and beating them up. And after this happens, people started throwing stones at the Israeli army. So uh, they handcuffed me to, to the side of the jeep where they were st standing. All, and, and they started shooting again rubber bullets at the at the students or at whoever throwing stones and they started tear gassing as well and for myself with one hand tied to the to the a, a vehicle or to the Israeli jeep with the other hand I couldn't really manage to cover it off and it was a very very a, a painful experience physically painful put aside the humiliation that comes with it and the feeling of helplessness and, 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 and hopelessness that comes with it. And the third time I was going to my leaving start exam, I was going for an English exam. 
and they held me for half an hour. They knew that we have exams and they thought uh, they will hold me for half an hour so I can miss my exam and fail the year. And they didn't, they didn't beat me up. They didn't search me. They didn't say anything. Uh, they just had me standing there. They said, yeah, in case uh, someone would come and throw stones at us, you stand here. And he was held at a gunpoint. And I couldn't run. I was worried if I would run to, to the school or run anywhere, either they would shoot me or they'll come after me, catch me and beat me up. So I went to my I went to my uh, exam half an hour late. Uh, the teachers were aware that I was held by the Israeli army, so they allowed me into the exam late. And uh, luckily, I passed. I passed that seat that year. And when I was nineteen, I moved to study in Naples. And it seems like there were a a, a few fighters hiding in a, in a in a place near the the building where I lived in the same street where I lived. So they came, it was, I don't know, half two, three in the morning. They stormed our our uh, student accommodation, took us all out to the streets in, in our pajamas, and they forced us to walk in front of them, in front of, the, of their bulldozer and jeeps. So the fighters don't shoot as, at the Israeli army. And stayed with them until six in the morning outside, just marching the street up and down with us walking in front of them, myself and a few other guys that were in my student accommodation, my housemates and uh, the house in front of us. And uh, in the end, when they, when they couldn't catch anyone, when they didn't find the fighters, they beat it up. They, they've beaten up a few of the guys. Luckily, this didn't happen to be a few of the guys they took out their frustration and then because they couldn't catch the, the 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 fighters, and then they asked us all to go back to our uh, to our student accommodation. So uh, that's that's just another example of how how our lives don't worth anything and in their eyes. And uh, this is this is one of the major points in, in the teenage where you'd feel like you need to go towards some ideology or identity or or just try to build who you are if, if you could remember how you were when you were when you were 19 and 18. And for for myself, everything I could think of is when this nightmare will finish. And I think that was 2006 when I was 19. And I was just thinking when this this nightmare will finish. And instead of thinking, where will I go? What will where will I hang out? How can I enjoy my teenage? Now another another a, a example that something happened to my cousin. Sadly, my cousin was studying a chemistry in, in Berzet University, and a, they stopped him and when he was in his first year at the Chick Point and asked him, "What what do you study?" And he said, "I study chemistry in 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 uh, Berzet." And then the first thing they said to him, he had a beard like mine, a little bit longer. Oh, uh, you want to become like Yahya Ayash? And Yahya Ayash is one of the, the Palestinian freedom fighters who was an engineer and he used to to uh, create local uh, uh, bombs. And he was Yahya Ayash was was part of the mess. So they accused him of walking the steps of Yahya Ayash, even though there was no charge for my cousin, and he was uh, detained in an administrative administrative jail for, for a few years. They would give him six months without a charge, just in prison in case. And this administrative jail is where they put people without a charge. They just put them there in case they might they might cause a danger to Israel. And every time on the last day of these six months, they will extend another six months for him. And then he will be in and out, in and out. And I think he spent my cousin around nine years in and out of administrative jail just for whichever he was studying chemistry. And now he's a teacher. He's out. He's a teacher. He never carried any attack against Israel. He never tried to develop any bombs as he, they accused him. But just for, for whatever he's majoring in college. And this really invites myself to, to call on all academics to think when they have an exchange with an Israeli university or when they have investments with Israeli universities, when they have research done 
in collaboration with Israeli universities. The Israeli government persecuted Palestinians for their majors in college. And then you would go with all your hypocrisy and, and have some educational or academic connections with them. This, this is a complete hypocrisy for a country or, or an institution that calls itself modern and, and a belief in human rights. I'm speaking about the Irish or the European universities that have a lot of students exchanged and, and say, relations with, with Israeli universities. Now, another story of, of this uh, arbitrary detention, it was my brother who went to prison for a good three and a half years, again, without the charge for a post on Facebook. Uh, there were some news shared by, by uh, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, I think. And my brother just shared the post of whatever Hezbollah was saying. And they weren't celebrating any military thing in their post. And then my brother was imprisoned for that post. They accused him of, of uh, uh, spreading propaganda, but they couldn't prove it on him. And uh, he went for six months, being again renewed for another six months. And uh, I don't know if anyone remembers uh, uh, the solicitor Salah Hamouri, who came from, uh, who was uh, a resident of East Jerusalem, and then Israel withdrew or evoked his residency. He was a solicitor, a human rights lawyer who used to advocate for for uh, Palestinian prisoners. Uh, he was. My brother's lawyer, I mean, Salah, came to, to uh, uh, Ireland. I've met with him, and he was like, yeah, I was your brother's lawyer. And then even this solicitor was in the prison with my brother. He said, then I became your brother's mate in the cell. And he was put in prison because he was defending uh, uh, the human rights of Palestinian uh, prisoners. So... Put aside that my, they took my brother, even the person defending my brother as a solicitor with the legal a, a power to be in the court, he was put in jail with my brother. And if this is not Abarthaid, I don't know what you would call it. Maybe you'd have to choose even a worse name than Abarthaid, but it's not anything better. Now, in my regular experience on checkpoints and on the borders, uh, most of the time when I go in and out of Palestine, I'd be held for questions, where I was, what I was doing. And one of the examples, I was I was working with Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sense Frontiers, MSF. I was managing mental health teams with them in uh, in Libya during during 20, uh, in 2016, 2017, during the peak of, of, uh, of uh, hostility against migrants there. And coming back home to Palestine, the Israeli army stopped me. They searched everything and they wanted to know what I was doing in Libya. And I've told them I've been working with Doctors Without Borders and they said, you should open your email now and show us all emails from them. And I told them I don't have my work laptop with me and it wouldn't be ethical because there's a lot of, uh, of confidential information anyway on the work emails. And they got so angry at me and then they asked me to stop for two hours, stripped na naked in a room. And they came back to me. They said, you, will you show us your emails or not? And I said, no, I wouldn't show you my emails. I don't have I, I don't have the work emails. And they said, you will have to prove for us through any emails you have that you work for the Without Borders. And then I opened only the email that they contracted me on through when they sent me my contract by email. And then they said, oh, okay, you've been working with them. We will let you go in, but don't go to Libya again. And I was like, it's not up to you where I go in my life and where I work. But even living abroad is bad. And when I came back to from Ireland, I came to Ireland in 2018. I visited Palestine the first time uh, uh, just after, after uh, the lockdown was over from COVID. And when I, when I went to... Uh, when I was at the Israeli side of the border entering the West Bank, they said, you live in Ireland? They said, yes. I said, yeah. They said, are you a citizen? He asked me, and I said, no, I'm not a citizen. Then the guy on the on the border, he said, show me your GI and B card. And I pretended to not know. And I was like, what is GI and B card? He said, you know what, it's your residency card. That's how they call it in Ireland. 
And I was like, that's very interesting. I can't lie. They know everything. It seems like, or they make us feel that they know everything. And I gave them my card and they took a Kobe without my consent. They took a Kobe from my, my Irish GIMP card. And then they let me go, a, 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 let me enter the country. And on the checkpoint throughout my education, many times either I've been beaten up on them, my friends were beaten up on them, were, were stripped naked in front of everyone or searched for no reason. So these experiences, they always happen and something very repetitive throughout all these experiences, they would always tell us you're animals. And they keep repeating, you're not humans, you're animals. So that's how they see us. And I believe even if they see us like animals, even animals, you can't treat them like this. You have to be respectful with animals. You have to treat them with with mercy, with care, with compassion. But yeah, I think uh, they even they even see us below animals. Now, other examples of apartheid away from my personal life, I think I spent half an hour speaking about it. I mean, it's very, very hard and emotional. But I'm putting it there for, for people to really understand how it is to grow up under apartheid. And I lived in, 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 in the West Bank from uh, 1999 until I lived in, in 2013. So it was a good bit of, of, of years where I lived through this. And I still go in and out. I, my, all my family members are still living there. So now the, the fragmentation of, of the society and the disposition of lands are key pillars of the Israeli apartheid system to maintain domination and control over the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinians in every facet of life. For example, by uh, 2021, in the West Bank, uh, uh, there were 3 million Palestinians living in the West Bank by 2021. It's a little bit uh, outdated now after all these years, after three years, especially with the increase of of building settlements, but these these three million Palestinians can only access forty percent of the West Bank lands, not the whole historical Palestine. The West Bank, that by all international uh, agreements, belongs to Palestinians and should be under the authority and the governance of the Palestinians. We can only go to forty percent by twenty twenty one. These lands. And the other 60% is exclusive for Jewish settlers. And the Jewish settlers then, they were about 800,000. So 60% goes for 800,000, three, 40% uh, uh, go to 3 million. And the whole 100% and the whole historical Palestine belongs to the Palestinians anyway. But that's another way of creating segregation and, 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 and using all our resources and, and driving people even out of Palestine. Now, about five examples in, in, in the Israeli law, we spoke about the fragmentation and disposition. Now, a very, very uh, interesting way to understand it uh, is the ID system. Now, there is one ID tribe for uh, Jewish Israelis, either they live within a, a within the Israeli territories, or they live within a, a, the West Bank as settlers, they have the same ID card, they have the same a, a privileges, privileges and rights as the other Israelis. Even though my, in, in, they're all settlers, they're all colonizers, so they're all the same. But the, the difference in the Israeli law, there are four different types of IDs for Palestinians. Now, the first two are a little bit similar, Gaza ID and the West Bank ID. It's a green card. It, it The cover of it is green. And it's under military uh, rule, which means people from Gaza, if they have to leave to the West Bank or to East Jerusalem or, or, or to other uh, uh, Palestinian cities occupied by Israel, like Haifa, Yafa, Akka, uh, they need military uh, permission from Israel and from the Israeli authorities. It's the same for the West Bank people. If they want to go to East Jerusalem, if they want to go to, to Gaza Strip, if they want to go anywhere, they will need a military permit. Uh, people from East Jerusalem, uh, their ID is uh, green, uh, sorry, is, is blue. It's a blue card. But they are not citizens of, of Israel. 
they are not citizens of Palestine. And if they become citizens of Palestine, uh, their residency in East Jerusalem will be evoked and they wouldn't be able to return to it. And these people, they can move more freely uh, between the West Bank and 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 uh, uh, the other cities occupied by Israel. However, uh, their passport says their nationality is not identified, and their passport is 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 a, a temporary Jordanian passport, so they don't have a proper passport. And a, a one of the funny stories that happened in in college, I had a friend who was in a relationship with a girl from East Jerusalem. And my friend, he's he he's from the West Bank, so they were all happy together, great couple. And when things came to decide on the future after college, where they want to live, they went into a dilemma that a lot of people go through when they are in a relationship with someone from East Jerusalem and they are from the West Bank, from Gaza. If you are from East Jerusalem and you want to live in the West Bank, if you if you leave East Jerusalem for a while, Israel can evoke your residency there, and they, they introduced a law called that uh, called the center of life. If East Jerusalem is not your center of life, the Israeli authority have the right, give themselves the right to uh, evoke your citizenship, your, your residency. So if you are, if you are a resident, if you are a, a, a resident of, of uh, East Jerusalem and you go in a relationship with, with someone from uh, with someone from the West Bank, and you live in the West Bank, you're most likely to lose your 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 uh, your ability to go back to East Jerusalem. And if you're in the West Bank or Gaza, you need a military permit to visit East Jerusalem, but you wouldn't be allowed to live in it. So basically, uh, you can't decide where can you live and you build a life. Now, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, they have blue card. These are the people who remained in, in historical Palestine during uh, uh, the Nakba in 1947, 1948, and they're they are a minority. However, even though they have blue card, the same card that uh, Jewish Israelis have, they don't have the same rights in terms of education and healthcare and grants and, and, and so on. And there is always discrimination against them. Now, in terms of disposition, no building permissions uh, were issued for Palestinians uh, uh, in general in East Jerusalem. Uh, it's very difficult to get them in the West Bank. An example of, of according to Amnesty uh, Research, Amnesty International's research, in uh, the year 2020, an average of 18 Palestinian structures were demolished every week by Israel in the West Bank. However, in the same year, 1,094 building permits were granted for Jewish applicants and only one for, for a Palestinian in the West Bank. So this shows you how also they take control over the lands, how they keep stealing lands from Palestinians and keep destroying the houses, the structures, the school of other Palestinians who would have to build houses to live in, even if they don't get the, the planning permission. Another example also, like Palestinian refugees and their descendants who were displaced in, in uh, 1947 to 1948, the wars and the conflict in 1967. In 1967, people like, like my most of my father's family, they continue to be denied the right to return to their homelands, to the former places where they lived. Israel exclusion of refugees is a violation of the international law, which has left millions of, of Palestinians living in a limbo and refugee camps without citizenships in many other countries and they're only unable to go back to their homes because Israel is not being held accountable and, and no one is enforcing international law against Israel. Uh, now, Palestinians uh, in uh, East Jerusalem, I, I spoke about the experience of, of having their residency evoked. So since 1967, over uh, uh, 14,000 Palestinians have had their residency evoked at, at, at the discretion of the Ministry of uh, the Interior, result, resulting in forcibly transferring them outside the city. And when they are transferred, more Jewish settlers will come. And Israel is trying to take over uh, the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. And we've seen the, the very 
iconic a, a example of Jacob who said, if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. That's exactly how Israel run. Kicks these people out, the Palestinians, the indigenous people of the land, and bring Jewish settlers to their place. Now, 35 Bedouin villages were in Negev uh, desert. It's home up to about uh, 68,000 people. And this is also, according to Amnesty International Research, are currently unrecognized by Israel. They don't have citizenships. They don't have IDs, which means they are cut off from national electricity and water supply. They live in tent or they live in, in, in very uh, basic uh, buildings. And they are uh, also uh, targeted by repeated demolitions of their houses and their buildings. And uh, because these villages have no official status, they also can't participate in political uh, life. They can't vote. They don't have health care. They don't have education system. So they are isolated and they are trying, Isra the Israeli uh, occupation is trying to drive them out of these villages so they can empty that place and leave. Now, from September 2000 to February uh, 2017, Israel killed 4,868 Palestinians, including 1,793 uh, children. All of these killings happened outside armed conflict. And human rights organizations are not aware of a single case where an Israeli soldier were held accountable for these 4,868 killings, unlawful killings. Uh, Jewish lives apparently they seem to be a uh, they seem to matter more than Palestinians' lives, and that's that's a, a something also very sad. And people would accuse me of of, of anti-Semitism and all this for saying this, but uh, like like funny enough, Semitism used to be our ethnicity, but even Israel hijacked our ethnicity and made it exclusive for the Jewish people. And if anyone else says Jewish lives doesn't matter more than Palestinian lives, really. You can see the last massacre that happened in the Syrah refugee camp where they killed over 270 people to rescue four Israeli soldiers who weren't in duty when they were kidnapped by, by uh, Hamas fighters. But it shows how Palestinian lives don't matter at all, really. I think that's 40 minutes from my side. So, uh, Thank you so much, everyone, and, and, and I am ready for questions and answers. Uh, thank you so much, Alha. That was that was really excellent. That was a really personal, uh, very insightful, very real, very authentic. Uh, from your life and uh, just you know obviously reflects the life of of Palestinians in in their daily uh activities the ordinary activities that we all take for granted in Ireland so thank you so much for that um really uh, really good uh Brian there was a couple of questions came up there in the chat and I think uh you you kind of referred you you kind of partly answered them but you also <laughs> said that that you would pro that you you would refer them to Ta Tala which I think is is a good idea yes indeed the first one is when born in Palestine do people need to apply for birth certs for their children through it, the Israeli state what authority or remiss does the Palestinian authority have yeah, now when you're born in Palestine, you apply for, for uh, the birth cert from the Palestinian Authority. However, uh, that's something I, 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 I didn't cover. But to apply for family reunification, you need to apply, uh, you need to the approval of Israel. Now, for example, uh, Israel stopped that in 2002. I am married, I, I, I am married to an Irish woman. She can never become a Palestinian. Israel prevents her from becoming a Palestinian. And when I went uh, last year, I have my daughter, she'll be two years in July. If I, I spend more than three years without bringing her to Palestine to register her as Palestinian, she would lose her citizenship as Palestinian. So uh, if you're born in Palestine to Palestinian parents, you can register your children. But uh, if you're married to someone who's not Palestinian, you can't have family unification. And if if your if your children are not back to Palestine on on time 
to be registered, they can never be Palestinians, even if you register them in the a Palestinian mission in the country where you are. Thank you. For sure. Another question here. Uh, I heard that Ariel University is apartheid and that Palestinians are not allowed to attend even for healthcare courses. Can you confirm this? Where does that leave us professionally and what should we be doing about it? Yeah, now uh, as, as a person from the West Bank, I'm not allowed to be around these areas. I don't know exactly how it works there. So to be honest, I wouldn't be the right person to answer this. However, I know that there's a lot of discrimination in the health care system and the education system uh, between even the citizens of uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And uh, I can't, by default, I can't apply and study in any Israeli universities. I'm not allowed to. Absolutely. And you would be taking your life in your hands even by going into Ariel settlement for sure. A uh, passing, passing in front of it. If there was a drunk Jewish settler with a gun, I might be killed just passing by, not even entering that place. And I and they have a friend. His mom is 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 an author and a poet. Once she took a wrong turn into an entrance of another smaller settler a settlement, not even a real, and uh, they started shooting at her. She just barely managed to reverse and escape. So even taking a wrong turn towards the settlement means uh, you might be killed. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Tala, we have a question there, which is a kind of a general question. Uh, yeah. Can you explain the right of return to Palestine? Does it affect all Palestinians that leave Palestine to this right up to now, uh, to this day? Now, the right to return is to all Palestinians who were forcibly uh, uh, kicked out of Palestine and all their descendants, their offsprings. So their children and their grandchildren. That's the right to return, according to the, uh, the United Nations. But in terms of implementing this, it's not implemented. There is no one case where they were granted the right to return. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's enough answer or uh, for that yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Often as young people, we enjoyed the, well, this is obviously a young person. As young, Often as young people, we enjoy the freedom to seek experiences and opportunities in other countries. Can you explain how difficult this is for a young Palestinian, for any young Palestinian to do? That's a very, very, very a, a painful question for me to answer. <laughs> because a, in my experience, I was being used as a human shield when I was in college instead of going somewhere else abroad to enjoy a, a gap year or to study abroad. A, only lucky Palestinians sometimes get scholarships to study abroad. A, they will be able to do it. But the time where, where when, when I grew up I, 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 and when I went to college, it was mostly curfews where like cities being blocked completely from people going in or, or out. So I, uh, even though the college was 60 kilometers away from my, my parents' house, I wouldn't be able to visit them every other month. So we wouldn't, we were not able to enjoy this. However, uh, I think in 2021, Israel capped the number of international students who would visit Palestinian colleges on Erasmus or not to 150, including lecturers. So Palestine or the West Bank can only have 150 lecturers and students visiting them from abroad. Okay. There's um, another question here. Um, yeah. Has the Palestinian Authority no jurisdiction at all? It's, it's a very funny question. If I would be honest in answering that, I might put myself in trouble. Okay, yeah, I, I quite, I do understand for sure. Thanks. Yeah, the next I mean, officially, in the three different areas, A, B, and C, there, there, there is official, like the... the when, the Israel, when the Israeli army comes into any A, B, C area, there shouldn't be any Palestinian in a uniform. They have to go to their offices. Right. Is that in all areas, A, B, and C? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, for for people who may not know, area A is where Pal where the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank has some well has some some jurisdiction has some powers etc. Uh, area B is they have less less powers than area C. They have no powers, right? Would that be generally yeah. accurate? Yes. Okay. 
Um, another question here, I'm heartbroken for you and wonder how you think things can move forward in a positive direction and crucially, how we can support that. Yeah, this is this is a very, very interesting question. A first thanks for, for, for your solidarity with us and thanks for everyone who are leaving one hour of their time in this beautiful day to attend. A, how these things can move forward to be honest, if I'm optimistic, I will I will I will be lying. Because what we've seen throughout all these years is that more more lands uh, grabbing, more restrictions on Palestinians, more killing, and Israel is getting away with everything they did, like literally everything. So uh, I believe if it continues like this, uh, the whole of Palestine will be gone just in, in, in the coming decade. How can you support push on the government to sanction Israel? Push on your government to boycott Israel, to divest, and push on your government to ask for the implementation of the international laws. And currently, because it's a war, to, to push on the government to uh, implement the humanitarian, the international humanitarian law. And the difference between the, these two things, that international humanitarian law only applies in the time of conflicts, how a country should behave during the war, because even wars have rules. So implement this now and also implement the international laws, uh, abide to, to uh, the United uh, Nations rules and regulations. And, and, and just to, to mention another remark, Israel was acknowledged by the United Nations as a state on the condition for them to declare their borders in 1989. In 1949, sorry, and to grant Palestinians the right to return. None of these have been implemented until now. Yeah, so absolutely. there are a lot of work to do. Yeah. 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 I mean, the Israeli state should never have been allowed into the UN. It entered the UN on a fraudulent basis, is my understanding. But yes, the, the, the people who, who built the UN are the people who supported Israel. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah. A, a lot of people are, are commenting, Tala, and saying thank you so much for your personal stories and your you're your so genuine. Uh, a lot of comments coming in uh, similar to that. Um, and pe uh, people saying they feel respect and admiration for the, for the Palestinian people, for their resilience and their dignity. They're showing under such horrendous circumstances. I guess they're referring to the way Palestinians in Gaza at the moment are sharing the little amount of food and resources that they have and we're constantly hearing stories that they're not fighting over over food they're actually sh amazingly sharing the food the little food that, that that is that is coming in uh how how did you personally find the means to cope with such which with, with these difficult circumstances and to keep hope for the future if you uh, i guess I, that's the question yeah yeah that's that's a very difficult question it's very hard to stay sane in these situations I go to my personal therapy every week because I think I can't survive without it. And a, to be honest, I wish I was there around my, my family. But at the same time, that's part of me wishes this. But the other part, I want to protect my wife and daughter from going through these things. So I won't stay here for them as well. So it's, it's kind of conflicting uh, feelings around me because... Every time, for example, almost every week, I would receive news of, of, of someone I know was killed. So there are a lot of people that have been un now, they're, they are buried now that I will never see them. I will never have a disclosure. I'll never say bye to them properly. I'll, I'll never bid them the, the goodbye that I would want to. So it's too hard to be saying while staying here, but seeing the work of IPC and other groups just gives me the motivation and hope and, and keep going because they believe we're not left alone. And what people in Gaza are going through is something that I can never explain because I am, I'm from the West Bank. My family is in the West Bank and we're, we're thousand times, thousands of times better off than what's going on in Gaza. So the only thing I can say is that what the people of Gaza are doing is it's a real example of, of pure humanity in, in the world. And what Israel is doing shows 
how ugly and how nasty the world is to sit and watch because everybody knew Israel is nasty when they occupied Palestine seven, six years ago. But now it's showing that the world is no different than Israel. Yeah, there's a question there. Uh, you mentioned that you're a psycho a psychotherapist. A psychotherapist, sorry. Yeah. Is there anything regarding BDS specifically within your own professional field that you'd like to see happen? I guess that's just coming from probably someone in that field. Sorry, say that again. So, so I mean, is there anything that we that maybe within the BDS, going yeah. the investment and sanctions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, within the, the professional field that 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 you, you operate in, that we that maybe uh, professionals in that area should be thinking about from a BDS perspective? Yeah, it's funny. I, I'm I'm not aware of everything in the BDS movement whom to boycott, mm -hmm. whom not to. What I could mention, a uh, one of the people who won a Nobel Prize for economy is a psychologist. He's called Daniel Kahneman. He won it for his book Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, even though uh, this book has has great knowledge, but this person uh, was in Palestine, mandatory Palestine was born in mandatory Palestine. And his family took over Palestinian houses when it became Israel. And uh, he was in the Israeli army. So for myself, regardless of how great the knowledge is he's using, I believe uh, he supports the propaganda of Israel by presenting himself as Israeli. Uh, I, I think Israeli colleges, all of them universities, should be boycotted yes. because uh, the psychology field in Israel has a huge part of creating torture techniques, how to torture Palestinians. Yes, and and I guess that links in with uh, academics for Palestine, uh, yeah. uh, which are very strong in in, in that in ter in terms of uh, colleges, universities uh, should not be yeah. collaborating with with Israeli uh, academic institutions because many of these institutions are effectively uh, supporting the military uh, and have yeah. are being funded by. The, the military and are, are, are using their research to support the military, etc. Et There's also a question, a related question. How can psych, uh, psych, psychotherapy and psychiatry practices help? If, if Yeah. I currently, I, I believe, like I, 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 I provide therapy to people who escaped Gaza to Rafa. I, I online provide them therapy because I speak Arabic. But I don't know how, how how they will manage for now to support. And I think the way you can support is push on, for example, IACP, Irish Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists, silent, still silent on the genocide. PSI, uh, I think they are still silent. They don't have statements. Has any, time has, has, on any genocide. Has, has any professional Irish body made a statement of any significance? I'm not aware of of, uh, of any of them, but they should, because yeah. if if it was Israel, they would make it for Israel. Yeah. Obviously, we we've, we've got groups on the national protests and who are uh, you know the visibly supporting Palestine, Irish health yeah. care workers, etc. But I think the professional bodies, I'm not sure if like for example the medical council or yeah, uh, you know I, I I they seem to be pretty silent. If uh, I certainly haven't seen any statements from them. Yeah, and that's that's shameful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a question here. Um, can you share the names of any groups or people or news sources that you would recommend? So anything that we should be keeping our eye on, any journalists, any websites? Yeah. Now, I I I follow a lot of the people that that uh, uh, you are following yourselves. Like I know you're Brian and Tom and IPC in general. Uh, I follow IBSC to know what's going on in Ireland in terms of protests and in terms of events. I follow Action for Palestine in Ireland as well. Uh, from Gaza, I, I follow uh, uh, Pisan, I follow Hind Khudri, I follow uh, Mataz and others who are bringing the, all, all the, the news from there. But again, I have the advantage of speaking Arabic. So I am in, in some Telegram channels that brings the news from Gaza, and I don't know if there is any Telegram channel in English, but Telegram is, is a good place where you can't be censored as much as as Meta will censor us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, and, and Irish artists for Palestine are, are doing tremendous work. 
So there, there are a lot of different rules that you can follow to, to get engaged with work. And, and if there is any opportunity, usually I, I share to my personal Instagram. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep people updated. Okay, we'll we'll share your personal Instagram uh, with the with the group. Uh, we'll uh, I'll also talk to you afterwards and maybe get some of the the sources that you think are, are worth following. And we're going to put a pack together, so we we will include those in the pack uh, afterwards. We'll also include your your slides uh, and obviously the recording of, of this session for people who who can't make on on Mondays. No, um, there is someone there is, says there that PSI, which is this, is that yeah. PSI is Island. Yeah, have made a statement after a lot of pressure from uh, pro Palestinian members who are in that group. Okay, that's perfect. I, I would love to read it. Okay. So uh, maybe I'm not sure if it's on their website, but if uh, if, uh, if, yeah, if someone... I, I am a member of BSI and haven't received any emails. OK, that's statement. interesting. So maybe they've made it. OK, it'll be interesting to see how public they've made it. Uh, yeah. et cetera. I just um, want to say want to say one thing as well for, for people who seek more education. There, there's a good bit of, of documentaries uh, are free to watch on YouTube. There's a stone called Justice made by an Australian TV in 2007 about how how Israeli army treat Palestinian children in the West Bank. Yeah. It's very heartbreaking, but it's it's very informative. There yeah. is a Tantura, the a, the memory of cactus. There there's a lot of yeah. documentaries that are very educational. I, I'd recommend uh, if you can pass on those if you can pass on those I, I will I will certainly pass them on because I, I'm very conscious that you're a Palestinian. You see things that we from your perspective that 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 we don't pick up right yeah. and uh you know what, what's your view on uh al jazeera the english the english version of al jazeera yeah it's different than the arabic version they use different terms but uh, in general we we believe al jazeera is, is is a place that's good to get information in terms of, of, of mainstream media in the west yeah at the same time they they bring a lot of israeli to to spread their propaganda on their channel to show that they show balance Okay. So uh, not all, not all Arabs are happy with Al Jazeera, but it's I watch Al Jazeera because it's the best a uh, news yeah. outlet in Europe. But if I was back home, I, I would watch uh, other channels. Yeah, uh, some comments there saying uh, social workers have made a statement. Um, the College of Psychiatry has issued two statements earlier in the year, but not very strong. And the person says I will be asking them in my professional body to issue a stronger statement. Um, Okay, Brian, is there anything else there that you're picking up? Any um, questions? Really? Um, did you have time for a question from myself? Yes, of course. Uh, what comes up sometimes is um, the Israeli right. state, like within the borders of the Israeli state, uh, whether it's apartheid, and there's discussions around it, and then you have a website called <clears throat> Adala, where it quotes 50 different laws that are uh, amount to apartheid in the Israeli state itself. Would you like to talk a little about <clears throat> about that specifically? Um, so a number of the human rights organizations, including uh, the Israeli organization Beth Zayam, say that it's apartheid across from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. So what would your analysis be within the Israeli state? Yeah, so within the Israeli states, I said the fourth type of, of, of ID is Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel. But they don't enjoy the same rights. There is racism against them. There is poverty there. There is a lot. Uh, there is lack of, of intervention. Like there, there is a band. They're a friend of mine's actually. Two of them called Dan. They're they're hip hop band. I I knew them through hip hop. Their songs are very informative. Like one of the songs songs they say uh, it's it's about his friend who got killed in Lid by 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 uh, drug dealers and uh, drugs are very. Uh, prevalent in these Arab cities because Israel doesn't care. And he said, call the ambulance and call them, tell them it's a Jewish who was shot. Because that's a very, very uh, recurrent theme. If you call an ambulance, even if you're a citizen of Israel, if you're an Arab, if you have an Arab name, they wouldn't show up. They would let you die. But if you have an if, if you have a Jewish name, they would say they would dispatch the, the nearest ambulance. Uh, another thing, even speaking Arabic, they would they, they, or knowing that you're an Arab, you look you don't look very uh, uh, European to them. They would know 
uh, how to identify you and they wouldn't uh, uh, welcome you, for example, in normal public transport. They suspect uh, having you on a bus where there are Israeli soldiers, but they would assume you might uh, carry an attack on them or something, even though uh, the prevalence of attacks from Palestinian citizens of Israel against uh, Israeli soldiers is, doesn't exist, really. Uh, there are many cases of... Uh, the last one happened last year, I think in November. Uh, a pregnant woman, a Palestinian woman, was stabbed uh, multiple times by an Israeli settler it's a Palestinian citizen of Israel, and she, she was killed with, with uh, her baby. And uh, no one is aware that this person who stabbed her was caught or was identified to justice. Uh, other examples, uh, uh, Israeli, uh, Jewish Israeli citizens, they get grants when they join the army, and they have to serve two years in this mandatory army, but Arabs are not. Uh, they don't do this because they know Arabs are Palestinians anyway, and they wouldn't go on police. Or, or or raid other Palestinian houses, so they they lose their their health care, their free health care. They lose their their uh, university grants. They have to go to study abroad because it's cheaper for them than studying in an Israeli university. If they were allowed into a, uh, an Israeli universities, there are many different forms of of racism. But the very first just a second, I'll turn the light on. The very very. Interesting a, 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 a example as well of apartheid. A, a other group of, of, of uh, rappers uh, from Nazareth, they're Palestinians and they have a song. It's called Number Five. And it's Number Five because when you arrive to Israel on the airport, if you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel, you would be as assigned Number Five for the search and questioning and so on. So number one would be uh, Americans and, and, and uh, Israeli Jewish. Yeah. Number two would be for uh, either Europeans or people who are friendly with Israel, they assume. So they would be still easier in how they process their, them, uh, their, their, their uh, uh, or how they would experience the airborne. Number three is either Europeans, Americans, Canadians, Australians, uh, who might suspect they are pro-Palestine, so they hold them for, for questioning. Uh, number four doesn't exist. There's no number four. A number five is uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel or uh, residents of East Jerusalem who were granted a permission to use the Israeli uh, airport. So that's that's another way to understand the experience of Palestinians arriving to, to an Israeli airport. For sure. Wow. Sure. wow. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the time. It's 10 past eight. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think we have some other questions, but I, I think uh, you've covered them. You've covered some of them and other ones. There's one about uh, human rights uh, and, and uh, taking uh, palace, taking Israel to, to court. Uh, we're, so we're going to cover that maybe next week uh, with John Reynolds. Um, I would uh, just want to thank you again, Tala. That was so interesting. We I will talk to you afterwards and maybe see how we might better uh, connect with you in terms of getting resources, even stuff like hip hop and the music and stuff like this, which is a very interesting field, which I <laughs> know nothing about really. Uh, but but so I'd be really interested to see, you know, how is there is there is there is there something that that we need to be aware more aware of in terms of how music can 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 help to to resist the occupation, to resist yeah. the apartheid, etc. Et and I'm sure you have lots of views on that. And and maybe we'll have you back again, maybe at some point, uh, because there. I, I think there, from what I can see from feedback and stuff, there there is a lot of interest in in these sessions. There's about four hundred people registered uh, to sign sign up. Not a, not everyone can. We have about close to one hundred and fifty who 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 came came in live tonight, and I get constant queries on on, on are the sessions recorded? Can we can we see them again? Because a lot of people just can't make Monday nights. So, thank you again, um, and. Uh, just to say for people who are on tonight, hope, hopefully we'll see you next week with John Reynolds. John, John is an expert on human rights uh, uh, in, in our International Court of Justice, the ICC, the ICJ, uh, significant cases, etc. Et so we'll 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 cover that next week. So thank you, everybody. Thank you again, Tala. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.
And thanks, thanks Brian. Yeah. Talk soon. All the best. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye.